Now we're on to part two of social cognitive theory. A key idea from social cognitive theory is the theory of self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is one's beliefs and the capabilities to complete a task. So does a person believe he or she can complete a task and successfully? <clears throat> there are four things that influence a person's self-efficacy. One is their actual performance. Have they been able to successfully complete it in the past? Have they completed a similar task in the past successfully? So actual performance, their past performance. Two is verbal persuasion. The, if you think of a cheerleader, the, you can do it, I know you can do it. You were able to add one digit numbers last week. I know you can add a two digit number and a one digit number this week. That cheerleader or getting persuaded from someone else through their uh, verbal interactions with you. Physiological factors also influence self-efficacy. Um, the feeling of getting nervous before a test might decrease your self-efficacy or feeling relaxed before a test that you've studied, you've, you have a higher self-efficacy. So how your body feels uh, can influence your uh, level of self-efficacy. And finally, vicarious experiences or seeing someone else succeed or fail at a task. Um, if you see someone, a model, succeed at a task, it might raise your self-efficacy to do that task. So a teacher can influence verbal persuasion, um, in a roundabout way, actual performance in setting up students for success and uh, having activities and learning fit the needs of the student. To a degree, physiological factors by having those successful experiences and, and preparing students well. And vicarious experiences, either the teacher acting as a model or pointing out models for students look, oh, Susie was able to do this, I know you can do it. So in a positive way, pointing out models for students. So those four things influence a person's level of self-efficacy. Self that level of self-efficacy then in turn influences other things. And you can see here four other things, or four things that self-efficacy influences. One, activity selection. A person with high self-efficacy will select activities that are more difficult or more challenging, whereas someone with low self-efficacy will choose easier activities. Goals. This follows a similar pattern. Someone with high self-efficacy will set higher goals for themselves that they're challenged to reach, whereas someone with low self-efficacy will choose goals that are actually lower than their, maybe their capabilities, but they know they can succeed at them. Effort and persistence. Someone with higher self-efficacy will put forward more effort to accomplish a task and will persist or hang in there longer if they have higher self-efficacy. So when they run into struggles, they'll keep working at it rather than giving up. All of those things influence learning and achievement. So if you're choosing more challenging tasks, if you persist longer, if you set more challenging goals for yourself, that's going to lead to a higher learning, higher performance and achievement. So those with higher self-efficacy will actually learn more and achieve higher at higher levels. So this is a key idea that we want to encourage in our students. Another idea of uh, social cognitive theory, which is one of the five key assumptions, is this idea of reciprocal causation. And you can see in this graphic that reciprocal causation is the influence of a person, an individual, on his or her environment and on his or her behavior. That goes for behavior. Behavior influences a person and be a person's behavior can influence their environment. And the same for environment, which can influence a person and a person's behavior. So if we compare this to behaviorism, the person piece would not be in there. It's just the environment influencing behavior or behavior influencing the environment. 
it doesn't go, it doesn't include the person piece. So we can learn from social cognitive theory that a person has a choice in how they behave, but their environment also influences how they behave. It influences who they are as a person and how they behave. And a person can influence their environment. We can also learn that a person's behavior will shape the environment. A person, the environment is not a static thing. So if we're thinking about teachers in a classroom, the behavior of students will influence what kind of teacher they are <clears throat> in the classroom from year to year, from day to day, which will then influence the students that are in that classroom, which will in turn influence their behavior. So it goes around and around. And these all three influence each other. Another idea from social cognitive theory is self-regulation, that we want individuals to be able to regulate their own behaviors, their own goals eventually. Now, if we're working with five and six year olds, this may not be uh, where they are now, but it's something that you can work towards with them. So self-regulation includes three phases. First, you have the forethought phase, which happens before an action. And this is where you set a goal, you plan out what you're going to do, and you become motivated. In order to do any activity, there has to be motivation. So the motivation occurs in the forethought phase along with planning and goal setting. Then you have the actual performance phase, when the behavior is going to occur. Uh, so performance phase is during the behavior. And in this phase, it's about self-control and self-observation. You have to think about, what am I doing? Observing your behavior. Am I doing this well? Have I gone through this entire page and not remembered a thing? Do I need to go back and reread it? So observing your own behavior and controlling that behavior, having a sense of self-control. That leads to the self-reflection phase, which happens after. This is where a person would self-evaluate. Evaluate, did I do that well? Did I meet my goal? And their reaction to their performance. Do I feel good about whether I met my goal or not? Do I feel good because I almost got there, but I know what I need to work on? Which then goes to the forethought phase for the next action. Okay, so maybe I didn't do well on uh, my math assignment today, but what do I need to work on for tomorrow? So that provides the motivation. I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly getting better. The goal setting and the planning. What do I need to do? What's my next goal? Okay, I didn't mean to the last one. Maybe I should keep working on the same goal. Or maybe I'll revise it so that it meets expectations. So these are activities that you can help your students work through. And hopefully they'll get to that point where they can do some of these things on their own. Now that you've learned about what is social cognitive theory and some key concepts from it, you might be asking yourself, okay, so what does that mean for me in my classroom? What does that mean for education? Well, here are five things that it can mean. Promote learning through observation. When you're teaching, have students observe each other. What are they doing? Observe you. Do a think aloud. Do a read aloud. So when you're working on reading comprehension. You might read, and while you're reading, you stop and you say to yourself, I wonder what this word means. I need to sound it out. Or, I don't know, quite know what they're talking about. Let me look at the context clues or the picture clues. So things that we want our students to be able to do that we know how to do, but we stop and we think about them so students learn those thinking skills as well. So promoting learning through observation. Describe the consequences of behavior for the facilitation and inhibition so that students know what to expect, why they're having uh, consequences to their behavior, and then when they see that behavior modeled by others, they know that they should expect a reinforcement or punishment. Uh, teach new behaviors through modeling. This is similar to learning. Uh, show students how to behave. Not just you or the students in your classroom, but you can show them videos, you can show them real life people, have people come into your classroom and model what does it mean to be a good citizen. Talk about that. That can be a modeling experience. You also want to work to increase your students' self-efficacy. 
through the vic vicarious experiences, verbal, persu verbal persuasion, actual experience, set them up for success so that they will uh, continue to be successful. There's a saying that success breeds success and you want to help your students to get into that loop so that their self-efficacy is high enough that they choose challenging tasks and challenging goals. And also you want to encourage self-regulation. Like I said, if you're working with the younger kids or maybe even older kids that haven't been taught how to self-regulate, you might have to help work through those three phases of self-regulation. But you can do that through modeling, through explicit teaching, telling them, okay, we're going to work on a goal today. What's your goal? I think your goal should be something about improving your reading today or staying on task today. You can help them set goals. You can help them plan out, okay, how are you going to meet that goal? If it's shouting out, well, let's think about your goal is to reduce that number of shouting out to once or try not to shout out at all. Okay, how are you going to do that? Let's make a plan. So encouraging self-regulation, but helping students to develop those skills as well.